back again. We got one more thing before we go to John to show. 490, 70, 560, therefore 490 takes you to 1050. Can't, can't show it all at this level and I don't want to shrink it. But 490 from, from 1050 takes you back to 560. These are time loans. Person's got a super mature by each 490. It's contiguous, but at the same time, it's in a historical context because if this 490 completes, there's another criterion that there has to be at least one person voting to know God, whether they mature or not, during that 70 year believer voting window. And as we saw, Noah was one of them who did that. Here's a 70 year window. Noah voted during that window, and he actually got to maturity during that. But he voted. It's all it took. Okay? And then you see it again with Abram. But he's voting during the unbeliever voting period. All right? And he was already a believer, and he's super matured. So the, there had to have been enough unbelievers who also voted to know God. And that was basically Abram's job, is to run around the, the, the land allotment given him and talk about God. Everybody knew that he was a man of God. I mean, his name even before he was a believer. Father of High Places was a name for priestly caste, but it was polytheistic then in Ur of the Chaldees. So that's why God cleverly changes it to Abraham, father of many nations. Okay, it's really cute. But he's voting during the unbeliever voting window. And then you got Moses, and this is the topic that Moses uses in um, Psalm 90. See, here you got the 70 year window again. And Moses leaves Egypt He's voting for God. All right, during that time, he's in the wilderness for 40 of the 70 years. He he obviously matures, but I don't know if, if it's a, his supermaturation isn't counted until the Exodus. Jacob's personal 490 runs out then, but Joseph's personal 490 doesn't run out till 266, 2666. So, you know, do you want to say that, okay, Moses really super matured here? Or do you say he super matured here? Well, it's probably more likely to say he super matured here, but he matured there. But he's still voting to know God during the 40 year window. And we know a lot about that fact. Because there's a lot said about Moses that God had him write out. All right. So for sure, his supermaturation counts by here, because that's the end of Joseph's 490. And it was Moses who led Israel out of Egypt, and you'd have to be super mature to even have that kind of strength. All right? And it was even harder for the next 40 years on him. Okay? At that point, the 2666 two, shifts to the temple, all right, which is right here, temple dedicated. And in, the, in between, you got David. Now, what you've noticed is there's a series of deadlines. You got a 490 deadline, a 70 deadline, a 560 deadline, another 490 deadline. You got a deadline for a 1000, and you got a deadline for a 1050. All these deadlines. Now, think about this. This shouldn't be too hard. Mankind has lived at least... Okay, from Adam's fall, which is when God measures time, because we don't know how long Adam lived before, has lived for, we know we have recorded civilization going back 6,000 years, not really prior to that. All right, man is specifically said by God to be created by God at birth, Genesis 2-7. So any kind of hominids there might have been that we're finding bones of, they didn't have souls. All right? So recorded civilization of humankind building, you know, places where they lived together. 
you know, and writing and stories and language and all that. We've only got 6,000 years of that, all right? But we do have 6,000 years of that. So here's mankind with these deadlines obviously being communicated because they're in the Bible, so people knew of them year after year after year, especially the 1,000, the 1050. So mankind in his, as it were, biology which is a, an imprint from your thought, you know, when you think and you move your arm to think, two things are happening. You got a thought in your soul that desires to move your arm, but that sends a signal biologically to your arm so it can move in response to your thought. So therefore there is a, as it were, a biological memory of the, the sort of biological process that enables your thought to control your arm, your hand. Well, by the same token, there's going to be a biological imprint, biological memory. In the 1960s, they called this biological determinism. Um, a biological memory of all the people and all the thoughts that everybody prior to you has had whose bloodline you share. Okay? And Adam's original sin is biological. He thought a bad thing. It had a bad effect on his body. Genesis 2.17, dying spiritually, you will die physically. So that got sent to our biology. That's one reason why we're, when it says born in sin, that's what it means. It's a biological transmission of the sin nature that's in your biology. So that's why you sin like two minutes after you're born, three minutes after you're born. You cry when you shouldn't. Well, it's still a sin to cry whether you knew it was a sin or not. Okay, so now think. All of this information being transmitted generation after generation about the 490s and the 70 and the 560 and the 1000 and the 1050 is going to produce, as it were, a biological um, urge that gets transmitted to the soul. So now when you see with your soul, oh, this is near the year 1000, you're going to start thinking because so many generations prior to you did the same thing. Oh, the end of time. Well, it's not really the end of time, but it could be if somebody didn't mature by then. It could have been the end of time then. It could have been the end of time in the middle because you've got all these deadlines, 490, 70, 560. Now, the more, the less scientific name for this, because science has done a lot of study on this, the less scientific name for this is race memory. Okay, what's well, been transmitted, every one of us, there's no, no such thing as a pure race. Okay, not at all. And we all started over at Noah. We're all related back to Noah. And what we call race is really not. You know, if you're sitting here trying to say that you're a different race because of your skin color, you're too dumb to live. Okay, because race has nothing to do with skin color. Geographical location has to do with skin color. If you and your ancestors and your ancestors and your ancestors spent most of your time around the equator, your skin's going to naturally be darker. Because that race memory, as it were, of your location is going to tell your skin cells to, to produce darker because the... The, all the generations before you lived near the equator. That doesn't have anything to do with your race. It's, a, it's an adaptation. Okay? It's the adaptation of your skin. It has nothing to do with your soul. It has nothing to do with your race. Okay? And your race is either Gentile or Jew. You got Abraham's genes in you or you don't. I'll bet you most of us do at least one of Abram's genes, because that was the promise God made. He said, oh, you're gonna, you, you won't be able to number your sons. They're going to be greater than all the stars in the sky. If you can number the stars in the sky, then you can number your sons. That was the promise that, that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 15, and 17. Well, there's only one way that can happen. Well, two ways. One is that 
Abram's sons do a lot of copulating, and he had a lot of kids. He didn't just have Isaac. He had a lot of kids. The heir of the promise was Isaac, but the number of stars in the sky, he had, he had, um, you know, after um, Sarah, Sarah died, he had another wife. I think it was, um, I forget her name. I think he had an, he had another wife, but he had he had Ishmael, and then Ishmael had a lot of kids, and then they all intermarried, and then he had of course Jacob also was his brother was Esau, and Esau had a lot of kids. So you got you got this thing going on with Abram. How, how many kids are kids of Abram? Well, if they're prolific, it could be a lot. Now, it doesn't even have to just be that. If you do what Abram did and you believe in Adonai Elohenu, Adonai Echad, Genesis 15, 6, then you're a son of Abram, and that's Paul's big point in the book of Galatians. All right? In the Old Testament, you became a Jew if you believed in Adonai Echad, it's Deuteronomy 6, 4. If you believed in the same God that Abram believed in, Genesis 15, 6, that made you a Jew. And then if you were male, you symbolized it by getting circumcised. But it wasn't your physical circumcision that made you a Jew. It was believing the way Abram believed. Okay, well, that could be anybody then. It wouldn't matter if you had a genetic connection or not. Okay, so, but this story about all these deadlines, 1,000, 2,000, 1470, 1540, that all would have been communicated over all of these thousands of years. You with me on that? And then, of course, now we come down to Christ, and that was like, well, David, that was a really big deal. Day of the Lord, all that thousand-year stuff talked ever since um, Moses wrote it. But now you come down to Christ, and at the time that Christ is born, the sort of Messiah story is all over. Everybody knows it. There are records of, of similar stories that are often mistaken as being like prior. But there are similar stories known all over the world. I mean literally all over the world. Everybody's got a flood story and everybody's got a Messiah story. So now think, 4200 was supposed to be the when the millennium was supposed to come. So everybody was expecting the second advent of Christ right here. And that's why John has to write in Revelation to say, hi, it was the tribulation was supposed to start at the end of 87, but it didn't. And I'm writing you at the end of 88 to tell you why it didn't. So everybody was expecting the end of the world. They were also expecting the end of the world when the second temple happened. That's why Paul is talking about it in Philippians 3.14, long before it even happened. Paul died in 68 AD. So when Paul died and then Nero died within a few months afterwards, everybody saw, oh, oh, the temple's got to fall. And they knew the temple was going to fall at the end of 40 years. All right. So then, well, is the, is the end of the world going to be then? Uh-oh. My backup started. Is the end of the world going to be then? So just the thing that I want to stress here is that you always hear at certain junctures that are tied to these deadlines that aren't necessarily the end of the world. They're just the end of deadline periods for somebody to super mature. But since they're so ingrained in the human psyche, people start thinking, oh, the end of the world. Yeah, well, let's see, that's 4170, that's 30 years away from 4200. Oh, the end of the world. Yeah, that's, you know, 4200 exactly. 87 is seven years prior. Oh, the end of the world is coming. And that's what they thought. But that wasn't the only time they thought it. Okay? You have right in here, starting at this point because Rome was coming up on its own thousandth anniversary by misaccounting by Varro 
you have between 193 and 235 AD, you have a whole bunch of Christians in Rome thinking the end of the world was going to come because Rome was about to have its own 1,000th anniversary. You see how that's a morphing? All people think of is, oh, 1,000. Well, 1,000 measured from what? So they grabbed the nearest 1,000 they got. And there was an actual riot that took place in about 217, 230, between 217 to 220 in Rome. And what basically happened was there was a guy named Hippolytus. There were two Hippolytuses then. And one of them started playing with the numbers based on the thousand with Rome, saying, oh, no, 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 really, Christ died. It's totally wrong, okay? He's saying, well, Christ died in 5,500. But that, that's not right. See? This is when he died from Adam. 4136. So 5,500 has nothing to do with that. He pulled that number out of the air. And he's saying, well, because of that, then, then you know, um, the 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 rap the end of the world the second coming because they didn't believe in the rapture by then they they'd forgotten the whole accounting oh well you know it's it's 5500 and the second coming of Christ is 500 years away and then they started mucking with the dates ever since all right so every time mankind comes up on a thousand and that was really a big deal here. And that's a genuine 1,000. It's like, well, this is actually 1,000 years from his death. You know, qualifying 1,000. It's really four, second, 490 from his death. It's really 980 plus 30. But it looks like 1,000. It's 1,000 years after he was born. Well, he's going to come now. And there was a huge outcry. And actually, it even started earlier than that. It started with Charlemagne. And you can, in certain cases, you can argue even before that. This is when Charlemagne is deemed to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor. There's much more to the story than that, which we'll be seeing in Revelation 17. But he actually thought, based on the accounting that was they were using in his day, that the thousand was coming. And that he was going to be the last emperor. And if he was, if he brought, revived Rome, that somehow Christ was going to come back magically and he'd hand his crown to Christ. That's the last emperor myth. And Russia believes it to this day. Only they think they're the ones to do it. Okay? So every time you got a thousand coming up in history, because of the race memory of the, these rules being garbled, like the game of telephone, People start thinking, oh, it's the end of the world, the end of the world, the end of the world. So are you surprised that now we come up on the year 2000? Remember all that, oh, the world's going to end in 2000. And then it was going to end in 2012. And then it was going to end in 2016. And already some people on the inter on, in YouTube I'm busy saying it's going to end this year. And the people behind Trump and the people behind Putin and the Arabs are all looking at this. 2,000 years after Christ's death, what's not often known is that the Arabs think Christ is going to come back too. But they think he's Muslim and he's going to come and convert the world to Islam. And their deadline is 1500 after the Hegira, which was 622. So they're really looking at about 2076 or so. Where's the 622 is the Hegira. That just means that's their version of the Exodus. It's a long story. I'm not going to cover it right now. There is this goofball statement in their traditions that says that the, the people won't last longer than 1,500 years. All right. Well, that's 2120, is it 622 plus 1,500. That's 2122. But somehow it gets truncated 
and I don't know why, to 2076. So there's a shortage of 46 years. I don't, I don't know. Oh, I know what that is. Jesus is supposed to come back to them in 2076 because he's supposed to live 40 years, remember? They got the same basic story as the Talmud. He's supposed to live 40 years, and then there's supposed to be six or seven, and some say 13 years after that, that there's this big fight to convert everybody to Islam. So everybody and his brother is real hung up on 2030, 2080, 2130. Now, those actually conform to real timelines that are real deadlines in God's schedule, but it's for supermaturation. It's not for the rapture, and it's not for the second coming. The second coming might occur, but there are deadlines whether the second coming occurs or not. So you see, the human psyche has been so attuned to these deadlines, going all the way back to Adam, not so much the 490, but definitely the 1000 and the 1050, because, you know, that's the deadline for the unbeliever. That we're, we're busy inventing. Oh, it's the end of the world because. Okay, well, it's, it's, it's the end of something, but it isn't necessarily the end of the world in the sense of, you know, the end of time as we know it and the rapture is going to happen, the end of time as we know it. And the second advent's going to happen. It isn't necessarily that kind of ending. It is the ending of a voting period. Okay. See? That's what they thought during the Crusades. Why? Because, oh, Jerusalem was taken. That's 1071. Oh, okay, well, that's a little later than 1030. You know, a thousand years after Christ's death. But it's close. Well, maybe the end is going to come now. And then maybe they're measuring it from when the temple fell in 70 AD. And here a thousand years, exactly a thousand years later almost, Jerusalem is taken again by the Seljuks. Oh, well, maybe the second advent's going to occur. Well, there was. See, here's, here's the historical 490. The second one. There was a deadline coming up. It just wasn't the one they expected. But that's why they went to war. That's really important to say. Because this is why they're trying to go to war again now. This is what Trump's people and the Russians are getting together on. The Trump Christians and the Russian Christians backing Putin, they're suddenly real friendly with each other. It isn't just Trump that's Trump Russia. It's 63 million minus however many are the Christians in it who voted for him. All of your head guys, your you know fancy guys on Christian TV and radio, they're busy saying, oh, you know what, seven mountains. Well, that's Revelation 17. We got to bring Christ back. This is the deadline they got in mind. And then, of course, on top of that, you got all the typical nutters that you have whenever you start to reach a, a, a 490 qualifying period. Okay. Um, well, I didn't do it. Typical 490 period. See, this is the this the second contiguous qualifying period from his death. Remember, I said 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. Okay, but this is from his death, and you got a whole bunch of people just like it, it's in their genes that they got to say, "Oh, we're coming up on the end of time. The Lord might come back. Yeah, you know, He might come back any year." But it resonates because we've heard we've it, deep in our genes from thousands and thousands of years ago. We got this idea about the deadlines of the 490, the 560, and the 1000. All right? So with that in mind, now we're going to go to John. Back again. So now when you see these numbers, they ought to make a little more sense. He's tracking 490 from Christ's birth, but he's concatenating because he's making a witty statement. 
the end of Zeno's reign was the end of 40, 491 AD. And just a reminder, you see that accent mark over the S? There's no such thing in real Greek. When I pasted this from Bible Works 9, it inserted an accent mark where it doesn't belong. And I don't know how to fix that, so just ignore the accent marks. There are no actual accent marks in the original text of Scripture. And, of course, this is one way you know we still have the original text of Scripture. I hope you're beginning to get that. Okay? You have the millions upon millions upon millions of scribes and correctors and all that still manage to preserve Scripture exactly as the writer wrote it. And the poor, the poor scribes, they didn't even know. They didn't know this meter. At least I can't find any evidence they knew, they knew it. I know since the Reformation, there was some awareness that the Bible had meter, but they never added up the syllables correctly. And they never translated it according to the actual syllable counts. So they didn't notice what I'm showing you. If you add it up according to the syllable counts, this is what you get. Now, you do have to know that there is a convention that all the Bible writers follow, and I've done all the New Testament books now, that the first time, and Moses started this in Genesis 1, the first time the text, the syllable counts, and you have to break the syllable counts by clause. In the Old Testament, you can do it by verse for some chapters. Okay? Like in Genesis 1, it works out by verse. But you have to do it by clause in the New Testament for sure. And usually by clause or by verse in the Old Testament, depending on how the scribes marked the clausing, because they actually paid attention to that kind of stuff in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the scribes were not so, they weren't aware of this, so they just wrote it out for a certain measure of a line to be a certain width to look pretty, and they'd even break words in the middle of a word. Like if they if that was the maximum width of the line, polon the l l o n would go on the next on the next um, line. They didn't they they didn't follow they they didn't know to do what I'm doing here. But if you do it by clause, the first time the clause sevens, just like in the Old Testament, the first time the total number of syllables sevens, that's a date line. The second time. It's sevens. That's also a date line. All right. There, the Old Testament writers play some games with that, where, like, for example, Daniel's second date line is actually a 73, instead of his first date line was 49, for obvious reasons. He's writing the 49th year after the temple's down. But his second date line is 73 because he's tying back to Psalm 90, and that 73 stands for 73 sevens. So you find that kind of variation on a theme. But the typical, the typical usage is to seven, and that's a date line, and it's significant. Because the people who got this knew what year they got it. But they were supposed to like, okay, what's 56 years before the year I got it? And that's going to tell you something about the theme of the book. So for them, and they knew their history well, this was not really hard to understand. It wasn't hard for me to understand once I did it. So each Bible book probably each chapter. I haven't verified all the chapters in the Old Testament, but I did verify all the first chapters in the New. There is this technique. This is what I'm writing you, and the date that I'm using, the number that I'm using, 56 years in this case prior, 56th year prior, is has to do with the theme of what I'm writing you. Well, that's not too hard here because the 56th year after John writes, Christ had died at 33. Now, I already knew that from from um, Revelation 1, which I already did the Revelation videos, and you can get it in John Dateline Meters, which is the notes. I have links to those down in here. Okay, there it is, John Dateline Meters. You can see the Revelation 1 meter count there and play with it yourself. Okay, but the point is, is that that's a convention that all the writers follow. And it's just a question of what number they pick. All right. Well, the reason for the other reason for the number to be picked here is that the tribulation was supposed to start. Remember, back here, Christ dies seven years early. He was supposed to die at age forty. Well, if he'd have died at age forty, that would have been here. 
4143. Okay, there's 57 years after that takes you to 4200 when that would have been the eighth intercalated 490 from Adam, 490 plus 70 plus 490. That should have been when the millennium should have, is real important, should have started. That would have been our 94 AD. Okay, well, if you count seven years backward, that would be the end of 87 AD. John, however, is writing 56, 56th year after Christ is 33, which is confirmed also in Revelation 1, but in a different manner. So he's writing at, he's writing at the end of 88 AD. Well, what happened? Where, where's, the, where's the rapture? Where's the tribulation was supposed to start at the beginning of 88 AD in order to meet this deadline of 4200? Because everybody's still thinking according to the old number where Israel was on a track of time symbolized in Psalm 90 and actually plotted out in Psalm 90 of 2100 years for the Goyim, 2100 for years for the Jews, that's the official Bible way of doing it. Then Messiah comes the second time. The first time he had to come and pay for sins. All right, well, he'd have to be, he'd have to actually die here. That was the schedule, but he didn't die. He didn't die in 4143, which would have been 37 AD. He died instead in 30 AD, seven years early. Okay, but everybody was thinking, okay, well, fine. And that's why Paul writes, I pulse in Philippians 3.14. If by some means, you know, the, the church is raptured before on the old schedule. Well, on the old schedule, the tribulation should have begun at the beginning of 88 AD, but it didn't. That's why John is writing Revelation. And it must be just before the end of the year, because it's still 88 AD, or he's treating it as 88 AD when he writes chapter 17. I'm presuming he didn't write the book all at once. Okay. So it's still somehow within... This number increases to 10 versus chapter 1, where this number was a 9. So some anniversary has passed. So he's probably writing after Christ's birthday. But, you know, or he's treating it as if he's writing after Christ's birthday. So he's writing at the end, st still writing at the end of 88 AD, might even be writing at the very beginning of 89. But math-wise, you still treat it as 88. Okay, so he's explaining why the rapture didn't occur on time. That's the purpose of the book of Revelation, is to show you that the schedule has changed. Now, since everybody was looking at, you know, ever since Adam, they were looking at this as the date that, you know, the millennium was supposed to begin, seven years prior was supposed to be the tribulation, and that had already been forecast. All right, so he's, what John's got to do is he's got to reconcile. To this old schedule and that's exactly what he does this is reconciling 490 years from Christ's birth 88 plus 403 is 491 you see that here he's reconciling to 490 years from Christ's death in 30 AD okay now he's doing really two things that are kind of clever here for rounding purposes, he's ending Justin at the end of 526, because this would be at the beginning of 527, sacred year at least. Okay. Plus, the guy was sick for a long time due to an old wound. Okay. So, in order to make the Kai work, it's at the beginning of the year. So he's saying 526 rather than 520. You get that. But there's another reason why. If John is writing in 88 AD, and he is, and he's writing at the end, 94, which is the old date 
at the millennium was supposed to begin, minus when he writes, is 6. You see that? He's reconciling to the old schedule here. He's reconciling to the old schedule by saying, hi, I'm writing six years prior to 4200. So he's adjusting the 520 to add six years because under the old schedule, the millennium was supposed to start six years from when he writes and then a new 490 from Christ's death. So it would be 526 to reconcile it. You see, so that's another reason he's doing that. And then when you get down here, it's the same deal, okay? He's writing, it's 560 after, 560 after Christ's birth. See, he did, he did it based, 490 based on Christ's birth. And then you got that 70-year insertion. So 560 after Christ's birth, but, it, but it's actually 567. Again, he's now treating his, his year of writing as a, the beginning of the year because, you know, that's a tribulation number and everybody would know that. And he's reconciling to the old schedule, all right? In other words, under the old schedule, you'd be thinking, well, the new 490 doesn't begin historically under the old schedule until six years after John writes from the end of the year or seven years after John writes from the beginning of the year. So he is reconciling to the old way of plotting the historical 490s under the pre-church schedule here and under the pre-church schedule here. See how well that works? And then he does the same thing. Here it's 584, okay, A.D., just 496 years after he writes. All right, so now he's, again, piecing off the six years to 94 A.D. and then 490 years after that so that you can keep track of whether you're on the pre-church schedule or the post-church schedule of how time goes. And then he's doing it again, only this time, He's measuring for 560. Well, actually, he's me yeah, he's measuring the 560 after Christ's death. See, because 490 after Christ's death is 520. And then seven years after that would be 560. Okay. And that's after Christ's death. So that's why it's totaling 591. So he's reconciling the old and the new timelines due to Christ's death being early and due to Christ's birth and death setting a new 490 accounting period. That's why he's doing it. Now, I haven't covered the history that goes on during this time. I'm going to, but I first wanted you to see that, see, he's tracking all five timelines, birth, death, old pre-church, 490, or 560, rather, from his birth, Old pre-church 490, assuming that you were still tracking based on 4200 should be the start of the new 490. Okay. And then from 560, based on his death, 70 years after the 490, when a new 490 begins. Okay, that's his tracking. So he's using all those timelines. Now I hope that this makes some sense. And I hope that you're beginning to see, wow, Bible's being really precise. <laughs> Wait till you see what words match these time periods. It's a killer. Peace out.